Hello and welcome back to the channel. I'm Michael and today I have a very long awaited tutorial how to use SPAN, which is a frequency analyzer plugin. It happens to be free and if you've watched my other videos you know that I love free plugins, but only if they are excellent, compelling and very stable plugins, which is exactly what SPAN is. People have been seeing me use it for the last couple of years and I'm always getting asked what settings I use, how do I actually use it to get a better mix or production, so I'm going to be showing you all of that in this video. But I also want to say, mixing and production, it's not all about analyzers and statistics and graphs, so do remember, trust your ear, be creative, but there are some really cool ways that a good frequency analyzer can help you out where you can't necessarily trust your ears. So let's just dive right in and see how to use this plugin. First things first, this is a free plugin which you can download from the Vox Engo site. I'll leave a link to this in the description. This is not a sponsored video. As I said, it's a free plugin. It's available in loads of different formats. You just download the pack, run the installer. It should go into your default plugins folder. Run a plugin scan in your software and it should show up in your uh, effects, which you can put onto your mixer. So I happen to be using FL Studio 20, but I know that this plugin works in virtually every DAW I've ever used. As I said, SPAN is a frequency analyzer and metering plugin, so you could load it on any individual channel. You could load it just on your kick drum, just on your bass, but I'm going to load it on the master channel. This way I can see everything. I can see the big picture of the mix, and if I want to hear it on an individual channel, I can just solo in on that channel later. So I'm just going to go to an empty effects slot, select a plugin, and it's down here in my FX analyzer, SPAN, and initially it loads up like this. So Let's just do some basics. You can resize the plugin, of course, make it fit your screen. Many people, if they've got a dual display, they'll put it over on the left or the right and keep this running the whole time. If I just press play, you can see that it gives you a load of information right away. A bit too much information for me. All these meters and these statistics at the bottom, I tend to find they don't help me out too much, so I just hide those by pressing this button at the top. If I want that metering and statistics, I tend to use another free plugin called the Yulin Loudness Meter, which I really love. As I said, it's free and it's excellent. If I hit play on the audio, initially it's sort of a bit of a confusing graph. Um, there's not a whole lot of usable information, but you've got the low end at the bottom, so you can see 20 hertz all the way up to about 20 kilohertz and a higher signal's louder, lower signal's quiet. And right now it's giving me sort of an average of the signal. And as well as being able to identify a particular frequency, you can also solo in to listen to certain parts of your mix. So if I press play, then I hold down control or command on Mac, I believe, and then a left click, you can see that I get a band to listen through to. So I can really focus in on the high end or really try to identify key parts of my kick and bass. You can make this band wider by scrolling with the mouse, so that scrolling up makes it a lot wider. Scrolling in makes it a lot narrower. And you probably couldn't hear that unless you were listening in good headphones or speakers, but what this lets me do is very closely identify where the real thud of a kick or a snare comes from, especially with the kick and bass, actually. What it helps me do is really focus in on what a specific frequency feels and sounds like. So if I play this again, I just solo in on, say, 50 hertz. I can really get a feel for how that actually feels and sounds compared to, say, 60 hertz versus like 110 hertz. And you can get a real good feel for how it sort of, how the thud interacts with your body and your ears. And to me, it's a good sort of ear training tool. Sometimes you think there's a frequency problem. Maybe you think it's at 10K, but actually it's at six or 7K and it's just a case of ear training. So let's move on. And just a few more things to do with the view modes. If I just play some audio, you can change uh, the color. I tend to prefer blue. It's just a little bit nicer on the eyes. At any time, you can press hold to just freeze the graph in place. And you can see that if I move my mouse, you have this sort of crosshairs. So you can go to any trough or any peak and it'll tell you exactly what frequency and note it is in the scale. So you can see right here, this peak is 411 hertz and it's a G sharp. This is a little bit too much information and I'm gonna change uh, this spectrum to give me what I want because right now I'm getting so many little harmonics. I wanna see a general trend of the whole audio. I wanna see whether my audio is balanced or not. That's what I'm really gonna use this for. I'll just take it out of hold mode up here and let's get diving through some of the settings. So I open this settings cog here and this is where this whole thing comes alive. So as I'm tweaking these, I'm gonna try and talk through 
examples of how this can actually help you and ways to use it as opposed to just pointing at a certain setting. First things I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the block size and the average time. So block size is pretty much the resolution of the display. I mean, that's kind of the easiest way for me to describe it. If I play some audio, I'll probably mute it to you so that it's not too annoying. But right now it's on 2000. If I change it to 256, you can see that it's all smoothed out and all of a sudden there's not so much resolution. So I actually want to increase this maybe to around 8000 or so. But now I have tons of harmonic content and it's really confusing to gauge an overall trend. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to firstly increase the average time so that the graph holds a little bit more. This means that it's not going to be quite as sensitive to the transients. So if I reduce this, every snare and hi-hat's making the graph jump around like crazy. Whereas if I increase this to say four or 5,000, it gives me more of a trend of what's happening over the course of a few seconds. And finally, to get rid of all of these little harmonic peaks, I'm gonna add some smoothing. So anywhere from a fifth of an octave to a half an octave, I'm gonna try a quarter or a quarter of an octave. There we go, it's a little bit more smooth. Maybe increase that to a third. Okay, so now I've got a bit more of a trend over time of what's happening. I'm not being too distracted by individual transients or um, harmonics, and I can see the overall trend of the audio. Before we go any further in the settings, before this gets too boring, how can this actually help you? You can see if there's any particular peaks or troughs in your audio. And a way that I like to use this is to compare to some reference tracks that I'm mixing against. I see where their peaks and troughs are. I see whether they're smoothed out, what theirs looks like overall, then I compare it to mine. I can see right now I've got a bit of a, quite a dip at around 2k or so, but I don't yet have vocals in this song, and I do imagine once there's some vocals, that will fill up the space. And there's loads of other ways you can get this to help you as well. So the low mids here, around 300 hertz or so, I can see there's a bit of a build up, and now I can go through my mix track by track and see where that might be coming from. It might be good, might be bad. Often when you're mixing, your ears get used to what you're hearing, so a spectrum analyzer can help you see if there's something your ears are maybe missing. What's even more amazing is that if you right click, it copies that frequency to your clipboard and now you can go and actually paste that into your EQ, which is just fantastic. And remember, at any time you can just use this crosshairs to identify the exact frequency of any of this information. Let's go through a few more settings because this can reveal even more things that you can't hear. At the display range down the bottom, you can change the frequency range at the bottom so you can see that it starts at 20 hertz. I can actually take this so that it starts all the way at one. And this is showing me low frequency information in my mix that I didn't even know was there. Haven't really come around to mixing this yet, but there's no way I can hear what's going on down here. These headphones actually go down to five hertz, but my ears don't. So now I know that I can just sort of gently roll that off with a high pass filter and uh, it might clean up that low end, give me a little bit more headroom. You can do the same with the high frequencies. So if you're working in a much higher sample rate, of course you can see what's going on above. But for me, I'm working at 44.1, so I only need half of that, which is about 22 kilohertz or so. The next two controls, range low and range high, they adjust the graph. So depending on how quiet or loud your audio is, you can get a little bit more detail. So now I can see all the way down to say, minus 160 dB. This is great, especially if you're recording and you want to know sort of the noise floor of your microphone or even your room, you can get a lot more information on there than you could with a typical dB meter. Same with the range high, if you want to see above zero, of course you can. Slope, I would leave this alone. This lets you tilt the whole spectrum like this. Before I go any further and bore everyone, I want to show you a couple of ways to use this. So because it's loaded on my master channel, if I just solo my kick channel, I'll still be able to see it in here. So if I just uh, let some kicks go around and then I press hold, I'll pause it now. I can hone in on the information here and I can see that, you know, 52, 53 hertz, which is a G sharp, that's where my kick is sitting. So now depending on the key of my song, which might be G sharp, it might be G, it might be A, I can change the pitch of my kick very slightly, you need to be careful with this, just to make it sit harmonically, uh, you know, at ease with the bass, make it all work together as opposed to fighting against it. This is extremely important in electronic music, especially house music, you might have all the right sounds, but your kick is just fighting the bass and you don't know why. Maybe you've done your side chaining, you've done everything else, but the fundamental frequency of the kick is just not right for the key of your song. So you can retune it or pick a different kick. Now I want to show just a few more settings. Firstly, this filled display mode here. I like actually turning it off, and now you'll see that the spectrogram isn't filled in. 
It's very simple, but I find that this is just more friendly on my eyes, so just do what's right for you. And then you'll also see that there's a second spectrum mode, which lets you know that there's an awful lot more going on here. So if we go up to the top, and I'm going to try to keep this simple, I won't go into all the routing modes. There are some really complex routing modes. You can do all sorts of stuff with this plugin, but there's some presets here. And one I particularly like is the mid-side stereo. So now initially there's no real difference, but if I change the underlay, you can see that I have two spectrums here. So the blue one is the mid and the red channel is the side. Often you don't want too much low end in the side signals. For instance, I really didn't know that I had all this stuff below 100 hertz happening on the side channels only. It's just very difficult for me to hear that sort of thing. Up at the top here, I can change between mid and side. If I go to the side, I'll probably just change that color to something a little bit different, uh, maybe like that. And then I'm also going to change some of the details just to make them similar to the other one. Now, typically with a well-balanced audio, you don't really want the side signals to be peaking over the mid channel, but it does depend on what kind of genre you're doing. And right now I can identify here that there's probably a bit of an issue, a bit of a conflict here. Where I've got a bit too much in the side channels. And just to give you an example of what's going on here, this one underneath in purple is the side channel. So if I take a mid side EQ and I just scoop out some of the low end from the side channel, you can see that all of a sudden it starts falling away on this spectrum and I have less and less side. Pull it all back. My last piece of advice for using this plugin is that while it is very uh, light on the CPU, I've found, as well as loading one on the master channel, I tend to load one on the current channel in FL Studio. So a lot of people don't even know about the current channel, actually, but it's a bit of a sort of um, curiosity of FL Studio. If you just click on this bit here that says current, you actually have a whole other channel to apply effects on. And what this means is that whichever channel you now select, its audio will be routed through the current channel then to the master. So if I press and open this span analyzer that I have open here, let's say uh, I just press the kick. So I have everything playing together. I can still hear everything, but the kick is the only channel going through this analyzer. If I now select the hi-hats, it's only the hi-hats that are going through this analyzer. So if I select that Moog bass, I can see what the bass is doing whilst hearing everything else. So I know that I just sound like I'm repeating myself, but this current channel sort of makes it as if you're loading a span on any channel of your mixer, but obviously you don't have to load 20 different instances. So those are some of my favorite ways to use this plugin, but I really do want to stress that for me, this plugin is really about two things. Overall trends in the audio, similar to the tonal balance control from Isotope, but it doesn't cost a lot of money. And then very, very specific issues. So sometimes on a vocal, you have a very whistly frequency or a very sibilant frequency. If you can hone in on that exact frequency and then say apply de-essing only to that very narrow band, it can make the rest of your audio sound a lot more natural. And I think if anyone watches any of my videos, you know that I really do advocate a very you know creative approach where you trust your ears and whatnot. But you could see you know, looking into the extreme low end of the track, there's just things that you can't hear. And sometimes it's good to just have something sort of that sort of like has your back, I suppose, in the mix. I don't, I certainly do not mix with my eyes. I'm not staring at analyzers and meters too much, but it can help you out. So I hope this video has shown you some of my favorite settings. Obviously, I've put loads of information in the description about those settings and whatnot. But thank you very much for watching. I hope it helped. And I hope to see you in the next video too. Bye for now.